Hey Blenders, it's Sean, and I'm here to introduce a new bonus episode of Real Blend, an interview that we wanted to bring to you that we didn't fit into the main show. Uh, it is the creative team behind the sequel that is coming to theaters, Don't Breathe 2. And we got a chance to sit down with not just executive producer uh, Fede Alvarez, who directed the first Don't Breathe, but the uh, new director of Don't Breathe 2, who is Roto Sayaguez. And we're happy to have them on the show, uh, getting into the construction of the world of Don't Breathe, uh, catching back up with the blind man played by Stephen Lang, and the reason why they didn't want this to become a traditional sequel. So I think you guys are going to like this conversation. Uh, it is the team behind Don't Breathe 2 here on Real Blend. I was doing research for the film uh, and reading back over a lot of the interviews, and at one point, I know when you guys were kicking around the idea of a sequel, uh, you had a pitch that Sam Raimi, of all people, called uh, the greatest idea for a sequel I've ever heard. And I mean, that just hit me as either, I needed to know, is your opinion of that like, oh great he feels that way or is it jesus sam don't say that because of the pressure that comes with a statement like that i remember we were there going like oh boy he just said it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it yeah obviously came with uh we knew that was gonna bring the expectations really high uh part of our secret weapon on don't breed one was there was no expectations <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> from the audience uh we were talking earlier today like uh, this idea you know satisfaction is is reality minus expectation. So that's, that yeah. is what, uh, when the audience goes in, I'm like, I don't know, I heard he's good, but whatever, and they get a show, they go, well, wow, it feels great. So once you throw that in the table, which by the way, it is the same idea. It could have happened that back then when we, it was another idea that we dismissed for some reason, but no, it is still what, what you've seen in the movie. Um, so yeah, it was a uh, it was a uh, big pressure, <laughs> but it's fine. I think he, you know it comes from Sam. It doesn't come from us, so that's good if someone else says. So. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So I, I don't. I'm not going to spoil anything from the second film. So I do have a question going back to Don't Breathe One um, because, and I'm sure you guys get this all the time, but turkey basters have never been the same since. I mean, just like seeing them, it, it genuinely is one of the most horrifyingly shocking things I've ever seen in a film. Just because. It just hit me, and I, I, honestly, it blew me away the first time I saw it. So I wanted to ask you, what was that for you guys growing up in, in, in terms of watching horror films? What was that What was that moment <laughs> for you in terms of like something that hit you so hard in a horror film that it just, it just blew you away, something that shocked you like that much? There you go. Well, I'm, try, I'm trying to spot that. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh... I think it's Fug Me Jesus. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Let, 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 well, let Jesus fuck you. Yeah, that's a line in The Exorcist. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. Yes. yes. And you know what? That that. I was paraphrasing. Yeah, let Jesus fuck you while she's, uh, you know, doing that thing with the with the cross. I think. For we went to we went to a Christian Catholic school, both of us. That was probably the most. <laughs> that was probably the most. So I was not right. The, yeah, the it most like, <laughs> shocking, traumatizing thing I, I traumatizing thing I ever seen. So the crucifix movie. were never the same for us again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was your turkey baster. All right, cool. I got but, it. And you know what? And you know what? It, every time we're, we're writing a movie coming up with ideas, we tend to, to get, for some reason, well, not for some reason, because it's a, it's society and, and, and art has been like watered down and we have become, um, sorry, but we become uh, uh, cowards, pussies, you know, and like we go like, no, we need to be softer and something. And then we, we remind ourselves like, wait a second, this guy did that scene 40 years ago. Like, shame on us, you know, <laughs> like we have to push harder and harder and harder. Um, Particularly in horror, I think that was a lot of our yeah. motto on Evil Dead. Um, I think back on those days. <laughs> You could, I don't think none of those movies we made could be made these days, but uh, back in those days, we were like, we have to push it. I mean, that's what people expect from horror. That, I mean, that's what the best horror has ever done. Like the, the classics, go to any one of those. There's one moment that you go, what the? It, it just stays with you forever. And, uh, and that, that makes those movies, you know, it's just, it, it is the movie itself, but the, we really believe they always have one concept, one idea you never saw before, even because it's challenging at some level, because he's, it is extreme in some of, or you just never seen it before, it blows your mind, so it stays with you and makes you recommend the movie. Something we knew on, on Don't Breathe, it was like, it's one of the things that makes you tell your friends, like, I've seen this movie, look, I, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's good or bad or whatever, you gotta see it, because there's this moment at the end that I just wanna know how you feel about it. <laughs> I just wanna see, you or, you, or you just play the movie to your friend just to, see their face when the moment is coming and just see how they react. So, 
we we it's not that we really try to find those moments. I mean, honestly, the, the the true story of what I hear about the turkey baster was we knew what the blind man wanted in the movie that he was to get the kid that was taken away from him back. And uh, so oh, how yeah. you do that? He has to force uh, Cindy, the the girl that killed and ran over his child by well being drunk, um, uh, the to 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 give him the more kid back and. And like he says in the movie, which is a like he, he claims he's not an addict. He just he just sees himself as a hero all the time. So so I think he he did he was going to do at home a homemade insemination, right? The homemade insemination, and um and we thought how do you do that? And we didn't know how to do that. But we know that if you you know if a single a woman that wants to have a kid and wants to do it at home, this is based in reality. That's what we Google. Uh, it says, you know, you go to a sperm bank and, and you get the sperm and you put it in a microwave and uh, and then with a turkey baster at home. This is all, uh, <laughs> not this microwave. is not me being not a science. science. This is this science. This yeah. is just what you will find in any medical like sperm bank in any place. It's a, a turkey baster. It, it says microwave. Believe really? It says microwave. Just very low, uh, you know, on like, or you do also like, you know, when you do, um, you know, on water, like boiling water, uh, how do they call it? Anyways. So, that's what you do. You do take you do the turkey baster, and you know, and you you uh, impregnate yourself. That's how you do it. I mean, just not. I mean, it sounds weird, but that's how you do it. So we thought, well, that's what he's going to do, and then suddenly, obviously, it changes a lot. The one he's the one does it. It becomes fucking horrendous scene. Oh. But uh, but that's that that's where it came from. It's not it's not us. You know, the turkey baster was already being used for that before our movie. Just yeah. you know. <laughs> well, I'll never, I'll never forgive you guys for that. I'll never forgive you guys for that. Seriously, jeez. I, I cannot imagine what is on y'all search engine. All the things you have Google just to be able to clarify. Yeah, yeah when we'll make movies, yeah, you don't want to know. Well, you know, we always, we always say that someone's gonna go in our, in our search in history, and we're gonna get you know arrested and deported to Guantanamo. <laughs> so we're gonna have to explain. We filmmakers just research. That's worse. Yeah, uh, you know, I I know for for all intents and purposes, the blind man is sort of uh, the the villain and the person we're kind of supposed to be rooting against. Uh, but there's a moment early in this film where uh, a group of guys hurt his dog. And, you know, I'm a big dog lover. My dog is sleeping right off camera, right over there. And instantly in that moment, I kind of went like, well, fuck those guys. Like, dude, go nuts. Have fun. Like, if you're going to torture them, like, make it hurt, make it long, like make John it painful. Wick. Yeah, like, I just like, dude, all right, go nuts. What does it say about me that within about 20, like, after we just got this first movie where this horrible man does horrible things, within about 15, 20 minutes of the second movie, I'm kind of on his side cheering for him. Well, that you know, that's because I guess I really don't have a, a, a an answer for that. But I guess that it's because it it is because life is a lot more complex than we think, mm -hmm. right? That's that's what it is. You know, like it, nothing is an absolute, and and then you might have a, a very uh, solid idea uh, or your morals or whatever, but then you put in a certain situation that will shake the foundations of your cultural programming and then you will not know what's good or bad under a certain circumstance, right? Uh, that's a uh, dilemma, a strong dilemma will uh, challenge your, your, your perception of what's good or bad, right? So, so we like to... to we, we fuck like with you guys. That's what we like. To do. <laughs> That's what we do. I mean, it, it, it's exactly that. I mean, the first movie we remember was like, okay, we're going to tell them that he's a poor blind man. Oh, I love that guy. And it's like, and then he executes one of them in the face. Bang. And it's like, what the? But then you go, well, they were breaking the house and, you know, he's in a, and then I got, we're going to tell you, well, he has a girl in the cellar. Oh, I don't like that guy anymore. But then we tell you, the girl in the cellar murdered his daughter and get away with it. And you go like, I like the guy again. <laughs> and then we go, well, but he was trying to do this shit. And you go like, why well, I don't like the guy at all. So, so it's, that's that exactly what are we doing? It, this is, this movies, although they use those elements that a lot of people find, you know, are mostly horror, non-horror fans find very offensive. They, they don't represent what they really are. They, they're fables. They're just, they're, they represent some other thing, your deepest fear, right? Whatever it is that, so we try to play with like, what if, what is this? And what if I tell you this now? And what if I tell you that now? So, and and it well, really truly did. We just 
fucking with you guys so you can be confronted with your own prejudice and your own ideas of what you think is right and wrong and and also showing you like never judge someone because you might not know you might like someone but they have done these horrible things or you might judge someone that you think did something horrible but it actually there was reasons behind it that once you see them you might understand so it is it is that is the fun exercise for us as storytelling when we create characters like this I mean killing the dog at the very beginning is like don't you love the guy? <laughs> it's, like, it's not that you love him, but at least don't you feel bad for him? Or at least don't you hate those other guys that were coming, right? At least it creates that very easily. So it, it is a, they're all uh, is writing uh, techniques that we do just to fuck with people. And, 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 but, and, and uh, the ultimate goal is to entertain you because the, the more you're standing on shaky ground when it comes to that, the harder it is to know how the story's gonna end, where it's gonna go. There's no way to guess it because the first way to guess how a movie's gonna end is to know who's the good guy. <laughs> because you know the good guy wins. So it's like, who are the good guys here? Who are the bad guys? Who, is, who has good intentions? Because Hollywood movies tend to be aligned with a universal morality of what's right and wrong, so you tend to guess the endings. Um, not all the time, but most of the time. So that, that's what we're really trying to do, to make it as shaky as possible and complex enough so you engage till the very end. Yeah, you could argue that line that that character says, "Are are, are you a bad guy?" or like, like that. That kind of like becomes that question that the character says to Stephen Lang because she's essentially saying, "You came back from war and it kind of messed you up." And are you really a bad person? Because it's so interesting how you play with us that way. But Sean, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Um, I'm trying to think of which direction to go because I kind of want to build off of that um, and the fact that Jake was talking about you know siding with different people the one thing i want to say to you guys is that what's most disturbing is that my allegiance has shifted about 15 different times over the course of this movie um and i know that that's my intention and so what i'm what i'm curious about is that right now going into this and i don't know how much of this you guys are paying attention to but the idea is like you know people watched the trailer and they were like oh they turned Stephen lang's character into the hero you know, and so I even went into it with a little bit of preconceived notion of like, oh, I guess they're going to make him the hero sort of thing. And he's clearly not, you know, and it's certainly not that simple. So how hard is it uh, for you guys to sit back and and not want to like, do, do you want to interject? And do you want to be like, <laughs> oh, stop? Me, we want to. <laughs> <laughs> is that really difficult? You know, when you start to see a narrative shape about your movie and you have two weeks to go before it's out that you want to say to these people, because because I think this movie is very sophisticated in the way that it presents characters. And when I heard that, it, it made me pretty frustrated. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, but that's why we talk with you guys. It, it, that's that's why we show you the movies because I think whatever we say uh, at the end of the day, it will be spoilerish as well if we just go too too deep into it. Um, in two levels, I think at, at the end of the day, I, I kind of get it at some level why people get you know obviously you get upset. There's a part of that obsession that that, that you get upset that is what we want. I don't know if you, on my Twitter, anybody that can complain can go choose my handle. It says like, I make movies to piss you off. So just <laughs> off the bat, like if you're complaining, just yell, yeah, like, go ahead and refer to our thing. So it, it is, there's something about that that's just a good energy and, and, and in cinema should do that at some level, should challenge you and make you mad about things and, and, and come out of there thinking about something. So, um, but there's a part of that that I understand that we don't want songs to be sing to certain characters in life. Um, I think storytelling got very complex lately for the better. Uh, I don't know, Jamie Lannister, for the you know for you guys that follow Game of Thrones, who didn't like that guy at some point? He was yeah, fucking yeah. his sister yeah. and murdered a child on the opening. The first, first, first episode. First episode. Yeah, first episode. Yeah, first episode. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, for some reason he didn't die, but obviously he was trying to kill him. And, and, and we like him later. Yeah. yeah, many seasons later, they turn around in some level. You know, I think what the, I think you can you can take these characters to many places journey wise. The only place we and we agree with mo with most of the audience morally, yes, we have to be careful what the stories we tell and how how you make the world feel the, the the audience feel that the world is. So our true point of view on the character with the questions like does it deserve to pay, live, die. If we tell you, we'll be spoiling the movie. You gotta watch the movie to know. You watch the movie and you know what we gave him at, you know, at the end. What do we believe his fate is? And that's where we stand on what to believe probably, you know, the, where, where life, uh, the, if you lead a life like that, how are you gonna end up? Um, I guess at some level, but it, and, and you could even argue, 
Is that the end of the story for this character? Maybe, because the end of the story for this character, it, it will depend. Um, so it's not until everything is said and done that you have you have you have show your point of view as a feel as a writer about a character. It's not until everything is said and done. That's when you go go. That's how we see. And also sometimes they're tragedies. I mean, you can say really something. You, you can give a villain a happy ending, but that doesn't mean we think that's the way it should go. It's just us saying, well, dude, life is fucked up. <laughs> Chinatown ends that way, and you go, dude, it's Chinatown. Forget about it. That's how it is, and 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 that's great. And and the guy John Huston takes his daughter. <laughs> it's just horrible ending. Do do you think the filmmakers believe that 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 John Huston deserved that? That's what is right. I don't think so. I think it's just they see life as a fucking horrible place, particularly after what happened to that. Film. They probably didn't have test audiences back then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, this is what I'm saying. There, there's something about the complexity of the characters and who do you put... I think to make them protagonists, you can make anybody a protagonist. It doesn't matter. I, I, I think is yes, to give them heroic journeys that redeems them from something that some people think you should never be redeemed from, that's, that's more complex. But still, in an ideal world, this should be a fascinating conversation we have about film and storytelling. But unfortunately, lately, we live in a world where like, it just people want to censor it. Like if we yeah, make, yeah. we don't make movies with taxpayer money, you know, just, <laughs> and, and we're from Uruguay as well. So we, we grew up in a different reality where our culture is aligned in different ways sometimes when it comes to storytelling. That's why if you look at our movies, even, you know, if you think about Evil Dead, like the main character becomes the monster of the movie that becomes the main character in the last five minutes. Mm -hmm. it, the, we have different approaches to it. And that, those things are kind of normal for us. Uh, and then we realize here sometimes that people get shocked about some of those uh, that just takes on characters and storytelling. But you, you got to understand also that it comes from a cultural place. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I got to give you guys a shout out, by the way. Um, this is not my question specifically, but that one -er, um in the house when you when, when they first go in and we're going up and down the stairs. I mean, that was incredible. Uh, one of the best one -ers. I I, know, I can tell I know you're stitching it. I, I can tell in terms of that, but it was really, really cool to see it uh, in terms of the immersion of that scene. Um, Fede, I, I had a question about this. Uh, I, I was wondering about this because I found this fascinating. In the original film, uh, when the blind man opens his safe, the number he puts in is 2978 which is your birthday, February 9th, 1978. And then in this film, there's another February date that's mentioned by a character of their birthday being February 20th. So I was curious um, what other Easter eggs you put in. Whose birthday is February? February. <laughs> <laughs> that's my birthday. Oh, oh okay. So, I want to ask, so that's cool. So basically, so can you talk about other little Easter eggs you guys sprinkle in? So her so her birthday in the film is, is Roto's birthday, and then the 2978. That's really cool. Can you talk about other, other little Easter eggs you put in there? Well, uh, the turkey baster is in there somewhere. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> no, it's not. It is. It is. It is. It is. You gotta spot it. You get. You, you get. We wait. Someone's gonna pause a frame, and it's super clear. It's like bang. <laughs> wait well, a second. For real. I missed it. I missed it totally. Oh, I no, it's really, that. really hard to catch. Really hard to get. I mean, you're, you're gonna have to. You know, but that's that's a treasure hunt. We'll yeah. send so, it. What, what kind of day is that like on set? You guys have to like make a conscious choice. Like, all right, we're gonna put it right here. Make sure we <laughs> shoot it in such a way so you can't really like that. It, obviously, effort went into not making it apparent. Like, what kind of conversation goes into it? Like, where you place the turkey baster? <laughs> well, I mean, someone. I guess I, well, we were gonna shoot, and someone showed up with that. You know. <laughs> And the art department, because they thought, you know, n n n nothing in particular. But they thought maybe they might want to use this. They guessed, you know, well, maybe they want to use it. So I, I brought it and I just grabbed it. I was like, okay, let me put it somewhere. And I just walk around on the set and just place it there. Um, <laughs> Stephen Lang, by the way, he remember when he pitched at the beginning, he wanted to start the movie on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> The idea was dismissed. Were we going to get an origin story of the turkey baster? <laughs> oh, the idea no. was dismissed right away because you could imagine what was that first image. Oh, but he had a true story. That's you know, he pictured yeah. that. I don't even know if he was tongue in cheek or he was serious about it, but he, he definitely wanted it. That's funny. Oh my God. Oh, wow. now, I, now, I keep, now I keep thinking about Grindhouse. It's like Thanksgiving. Remember that, those trailers that happened in between? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when, the, when John Carpenter made the first Halloween, Michael Myers was very clearly a man. Like, he was terrifying and he was horrifying, but he was a man. Over, you know, 40 years worth of sequels, he's kind of evolved into this monster and you can't really kill him and he lives forever and it is what it is. It's just the evolution of horror. 
obviously with this series, the blind man is is a man. But as you progress with this series, and, and Stephen Lang made a joke about playing this character until he's dead, like how do you refrain from making him that kind of like invincible monster? Because because a lot of times that makes it easy to get out of situations. But how do you not turn him into sort of this Michael Myers, you can he can never be killed kind of monster? I think I think we we make it clear that he's a human being, mm-hmm. and 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 uh, that's why we decided to tell the story. You know, to to go into to take a closer look at, at this guy and, and explore his his psychology and you know everything that's going on inside his head. Uh, and, and I think uh, after this movie, it's, it's pretty clear that this is a, a real human being, very flawed, that it's been in a, in a very d- d- dark place for a very long time, uh, that it's been through a lot of pain, and that has caused a lot of pain, but it's clearly a human being. It's not a supernatural force by any for means. For now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the next one he gets some yeah. voodoo shit. Like, like don't breathe eight. Is it gonna be? Is it gonna be the You're blind giving me man ideas, in space? man? You're giving me ideas. <laughs> don't breathe eight. Voodoo. Home for the holidays. Maybe some voodoo ritual on him, and like suddenly he lives forever. I want to ask real quick too, as a follow up. There's a moment when Rylan gets a, a, a to, he gets asked how many people they should send. And he screams, uh, all of you! And I have to, <laughs> is that an Oldman? Is that a Gary Oldman homage? Everyone! <laughs> Every- that line so, delivery the true story that, that that scene, I heard Gary Oldman saying, like, he was joking. He wasn't going to play like that. He was like, yeah. he played small, and I think, the, the, you know, uh, Luc Besson says, like, can you do it bigger? Like, what, like this? <laughs> <laughs> and they go, like, he, he, that's the take. <laughs> <laughs> the runner, I, I, was that your was that your direction? Is that what you told? No, me? I think I think that that is something that we were, were playing around with Fede <laughs> even, at, uh, even at the writing stage, you know. And, but that tells you guys you know, that 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 what we do is we 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 play with this and we have a lot of fun, you know. And there's a lot of that. Just oh, just like, remember that scene? Yeah, we just said all much or whatever. And and that is a part of the process, you know. It's, we are more than filmmakers. We are we are we are uh, fans. Of movies, you know, <laughs> so it's 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 a lot of fun to to play with those elements and and and, mm. and hide them in a way in the movies that we make. And most people, the reality is like you got to think about this way. It's like, um, what year is that movie from? It's like what ninety something, ninety five, seven, ninety seven, yeah, yeah. twenty three years ago. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's like you know, more than twenty years ago. Imagine when when you watch a movie, you're nineteen ninety two, right? That summer, you watch this movie. It's great. It has a line in it, and and you, and, and your father goes like, "That's from a movie." <laughs> In 1972, <laughs> like Gene Hackman, yeah. Gene Hackman says a similar line. Now that's you us. were in '95. You go like, I don't give yeah, shit. Yeah. Like I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I enjoyed it as well. So that that's that's the way we see it. Most of the time, if there's enough in the past, I do that. I translate it that way, and I know that most of the audience won't go like, how dare they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is one I, that is I, worse I, than that. By the way, I'm sure you'll get to that. But well, let's let's continue. Well, one of the things I wanted to bring up specifically is it, it, I, I know that on the first Don't Breathe, Steve, uh, Stephen Lang wore contact lenses that partially essentially gave him a, bl- a blind element to the in terms of like the performance. I was curious if anything changed from Don't Breathe 1 to Don't Breathe 2 in terms of how you were going to execute the blindness. And specifically, like there's scenes in this film where he's swinging like some pretty insane things while blind. And I wonder if he's in fact wearing those contact lenses in those moments, how he even knows in terms of blocking what he's hitting, what's in front of him. Um, can you walk through kind of like the process of what, what, what it was from the first one to the second one and kind of how you do execute the blindness for the character? Well, you know, uh, I'll tell you this. Fetish shot the first movie and I thought I had exa- the exact same question that you're asking me now. And then when I went on to shoot this one, with that question in mind, I realized that the answer is no, he can't see shit and you better get out of the way and it's <laughs> dangerous. And he is swinging the machete just like that. And you know, you, what we gotta do is just clear out. <laughs> but that, and that's it. And then, and then how does he hit his marks? You do it, you do it a, th- a thousand times. That's, the, that's why you do it. it. Yeah, it's very complicated. And on top of that, you had dogs. So at some point, we have Stephen Lang, 
who can't see anything and a dog both in the same scene. <laughs> Imagine that. In their minds. <laughs> How blind is it? Do the contacts make him? Is it fully? Can he, can he see anything? No, he can see a little bit. He said that it's like he can see like 20, 15, 20 percent. So wow. he's pretty much blind. So the mark, you know, you put marks for actors, you know, that's your mark here. You got to hit it. Usually it's just a piece of tape. For, for him, it's like a big green light this big. Oh. Otherwise, he doesn't see it. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I was actually that was like I was watching him swing that thing. I'm like, how the hell were they filming this if he's actually wearing those contacts? So, yeah, <laughs> Jake, go ahead. It is tricky. Um, yeah, um, you know, I I know that Sam Raimi helped you guys out a lot uh, whenever you guys were working on the remake of Evil Dead. But I was curious, you know, he gave you advice that you probably remember your entire career. In 20 years, if someone comes to you and says they want to remake Don't Breathe, what's the most important piece of advice that you would give them based on what you've you've learned on this film? Great question. Um, great question. Well, you know what I would say, what, what Sam told us, he said, just uh, make it your own, you know, and, and don't, try, don't try to be me, meaning Sam, right? Just make your own. Uh, and that was liberating for us, right? So I guess we would say the same thing. Yeah, the, the, on, on Evil Dead, it really allowed us, allowed us to, to take the material and run with it and... and um, and not feeling that there was a target we need to hit, that there was no right answer uh, when it came to what was the story we need to tell. Um, it was it was really him going like, you know, the movies out there, you know, use whatever you want and uh, or don't, you know, just make it your own. And and uh, he guided us also through the process of of different versions, probably different uh, original ideas for that film. Um, I think that's it, support is what you want usually from a producer and uh, someone someone that believes in you and lets you do your thing and and uh, and just and you can generally see that he that you know that he believes in you. That is not bullshit what they're saying. That they truly believe in you and that that empowers you a lot. And that's what you want as a filmmaker to 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 feel you know uh, you know I think confident enough. To just tell certain stories in a certain way and just do it, make your own thing. Yeah. Well, guys, we are um, incredibly thankful for having you guys on the show. Uh, that was fun. Really, really appreciate the time and enjoy talking to you guys. I, I know. L listen, we're trained as as you know a Marvel audience to stay to the end credits. I want you guys j just let people know that they should stay all the way till the very end because you have a little surprise for them. We yeah. I mean, if there might be nothing at the end, there might be something. <laughs> but at the very, very, very end. The very, very end. Roll ends, yeah. Yes, I'm glad that that's my tradition to stay because I would have I would have yeah. gotten up and ran to the bathroom. So just <laughs> and a, next a time note release, to everyone. Release Don't Breathe 3 on Thanksgiving if you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You guys. Have Thank a good you night. It was a blast. Thank you, guys. Oh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Naturally, we want to thank Sony for giving us time with Fede and Roto. We're going to review Don't Breathe 2 on the main show, which should be out later this week, probably on Thursday. So make sure you're looking out uh, for our conversation about that. Uh, spoiler alert, I liked it a lot more than I thought, but that's all I can tell you right now. Uh, going forward, I want to remind you guys that we're going, doing the live tweet of Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's going to be the entire Real Blend team, as well as a lot of really cool people from Cinema Blend. Uh, that's going to be on Monday, August 30th, and all the information is on our socials. So make sure that you get your copy of Raiders and be ready to tweet along with us. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll see you when the, the main show kicks back up with plenty of more interviews and commentary about all the things you guys love uh, in the world of movies.